Hello, my name is Matt Bolden, and this is my history research project. So I guess this introduction video is pretty much my thesis statement for this in research paper format. Basically, my topic's probably going to confuse a lot of people, because not too many people are as well versed in horror movies as I am. I've been watching them since I was a kid, and about a year ago I started doing a... I started reviewing them on YouTube, and that's probably my biggest hobby. So, for this research paper, I decided to do horror slash sci-fi films of the 1950s and how they reflect the fears and the culture of the time. So, I picked five films as examples. The first one is, uh, well, I haven't decided in order yet, so I'm just going to tell you the films. In no particular order, The Thing from Another World will be showing The Red Scare in the 1950s. Uh, Them will be portraying the fear of nuclear radiation. The Creature from the Black Lagoon will be repressed sexuality. That's a hard one to do. I just found out because I just did that segment. Um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers will represent conformity. And The Incredible Shrinking Man will represent social alienation. I believe these five films strongly reflect those issues in a very subtle manner, or not so subtle in some cases, but this is what my project is about, this is what I'm doing, and it's about these films and their cultural relevance. So enjoy. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, directed by Don Siegel, based on a story by Jack Finney, starring Kevin McCarthy and Dana Winter. It tells the story of the fictional town of Santa Mira, where the populace begins acting strangely stoic and showing no emotion at all. We later find out that the entire population has been replaced by perfect alien replicas, indistinguishable except for their lack of emotion. How does this reflect conformity in the 1950s, and is it still relevant to this day? Invasion of the Body Snatchers reflects conformity in the 1950s in the sense that the monster or the enemy isn't a man built of dead body parts or an ancient evil from the old world. The enemy is us and you can't stop it. It's very human emotion to fear not fitting in and that's a very primal fear so in this instance people are sacrificing their emotions their individuality for security in these alien pods and I think there's a specific scene in the movie where Kevin McCarthy's character claims that we've always taken it for granted but now we have to fight to retain our humanity by not showing it because the only thing that separates the main characters from these pods is their emotions and so to go under the radar to not be caught they have to act completely stoic which one character can cannot manage to do because she sees a dog get hit by a car and she freaks out so she's discovered and that's that is a very frightening enemy it's there's a, another really good quote by uh, John Carpenter who and he says that there are two types of horror films there's the external evil you know the enemy is out there in the woods it's the other tribe it's the people that don't look like us don't speak like us don't act like us but the other type of people is in here it's us I've seen the enemy and it is us and I think the internal evil is definitely addressed in this film and in one of the final scenes Kevin McCarthy's character finds these pods that the human clones are growing from and he starts smashing and destroying them and he stabs the one with a pitchfork but there's no catharsis in this destruction 
because you can't kill a human act. Conformity will never die by any means, but it's just frightening. There's no emotional purge in this scene. There's just no death to something that has no life. And I think the fruitless battle of conformity was definitely a serious undertone in the Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And it really goes back to how we view the 1950s. You know, white picket fences, leave it to beaver, everyone's swell and hunky-dory. But it really wasn't. So what is it these pods represent? What is it that can take our humanity away from us? Maybe it's technology. How much longer until your smartphone starts actually doing the thinking for you? Who knows? Maybe it's just the garbage culture we live in right now. This one's gonna be a little weird. Please bear with me. Creature from the Black Lagoon, released in 1954, it was directed by Jack Arnold, written by Maurice Sim, starring Richard Carlson and Julie Adams. It tells the story of a group of scientists along the Amazon who discover a fossil that may uncover the link between man and fish. Well, do they know? This creature still exists, and it is known as the creature from the Black Lagoon. I plan on tying repressed sexuality into this story. Trust me, it's gonna work out. Man, that shepherd's good. Oh, I'm still recording. Oh. Okay, so how does the creature from the Black Lagoon represent repressed sexuality in the 1950s? Well, for one, he's a giant walking scaly phallus. Yeah. If only that point was valid enough to make my argument, this segment would be much easier, but it's not. My reasoning for this movie representing repressed sexuality is the fact that he is something primal, something that's been around since the beginning of time. He is the failure of evolution, and mankind wants to destroy it. They want to repress or hide his existence, which doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, if you found the missing link between amphibians and homo sapiens, wouldn't you want to explore that? Wouldn't you want to know about it? But no, they seek out to destroy something that is primal and has been here since the beginning of time much like the human sex drive. And around the time that this movie came out, it came out in 1954, the year before Alfred, Alfred Kinsey, a famous but controversial doctor, put out his the Kinsey Report on Female Sexuality. And in 1948, he put out the Kinsey Report on the Human Male Sexuality. And these writings were very controversial at the time, because they explored all matter of sexual intercourse and sexual orientation and in the 50s people weren't quite comfortable with that yet so I think this film strongly reflect, reflects the teachings of Alfred Kinsey you have a lot of very subtle homoerotic moments in this movie and that's not just me being a teenage boy saying oh that's good no it's very subtle and it's not just you know college humor it's done to show a point, and this is a really hard argument to make, but I really think it's a strong one. It's just a complete denial that people have sex in this movie. It's just total repression in the sense that it's not pretty and it's not clean, 
so it's not American, and it shouldn't be seen or heard. So that's my argument on sexuality and the creature from the Black Lagoon. I think it makes sense. If I just sound like a rambling idiot, then I guess this project's not going to go too well. Wish me luck. Science didn't know, but dedicated scientists were willing to risk their lives to find out. This lungfish, the bridge between fish and the land animal, this one was a failure. It hasn't changed in millions of years. But here, here we have a clue to an answer. Starring Richard Carlson, grimly adventuring underwater in the depths of the mighty Amazon. Lovely Julia Adams, her beauty, allure even to the man-beast from the dawn of time. With Richard Denning, whose scientific passion turned to the fury of revenge. You'll see the most amazing underwater photography that the... The Incredible Shrinking Man, directed by Jack Arnold, written by Richard Matheson, and starring Grant Williams, appears to be your typical 1950s B-movie on the surface that tells a deep tale of social alienation. The story follows Scott Carey, a six-foot-two businessman who is exposed to a cloud of atomic radiation and begins shrinking in stature. As he shrinks to dwarf status, Scott decides to sell his life story to the national press to his great humiliation. Finally, he decides to leave his family to live out his final days as he shrinks to atomic size and then eventually dies. Social alienation was felt by many but expressed by few in the 1950s. One particular group would be returning World War II veterans coming back from Europe missing chunks of their bodies and being just living pieces of human beings but this movie really expressed it to me in that he has to leave his home because he doesn't feel like he's human anymore he's no longer accepted as a part of this race just because of this disorder and it shows it in a lot of scenes such as whenever uh, he befriends a circus dwarf after he leaves his family they're about the same height three foot and they become friends and she tells him you know the world's not that bad the sky's just as blue for us as it is for the normal sized people but he knows it's different for him because he's going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and his own cat turns on him which is gotta be quite a blow to the ego whenever your own house cat tries to kill you and he ends up living in his daughter's dollhouse, which has got to be morally devastating. But I think, even though he becomes this extreme outsider because of this disability, it still rings through with this quote that he says at the end of the movie. I was to continue to shrink to become what? Infinitesimal? What was I? Still a human being or was I the man of the future? If there were burst in radiation, other clouds drifting across the seas and continents, would other beings follow me into this vast new world? And if I felt my body dwindling, melting, becoming nothing, my fears melted away, in their place came acceptance. All this vast majesty of creation, it had mean something to it. And then I meant something too. Yes, smaller than the smallest, I meant something too. To God there is no zero. I still exist. So even being so different from everyone else he still found meaning in life and there's more to being an outsider in the 1950s than just living in S.D. Perry's novel not everyone was a Socia or Greece there were other people with much larger problems than not fitting in as a teenager and social alienation just it affected more people than you would think in the 1950s so in that way I believe the incredible shrinking man completely reflected the complete feeling of loneliness and being an outcast in a time of great conformity as I expressed in my Invasion of the Body Snatchers uh, segment. 
anyway. The next time you feel embarrassed and you feel like you're three feet tall, just be thankful you aren't. Today, he's two inches tall, and you can hold him in the palm of your hand. Now he lives in a world where he must fight for his life, a world where a friendly house cat is a predatory monster. Incredible, because it's almost beyond imagining. Incredible, because every hour he gets smaller and smaller. Incredible, because every moment the terror mounts. My argument pretty much makes itself on this one. Then was the 1954 black and white science fiction film, directed by Gordon Douglas, written by George Worthing Yates, starring James Whitmore and Ed McGuinn. It tells the story of the New Mexico police force in their fight against a nest of giant, radiated ants. Yeah, I think this pretty well reflects the fear of nuclear radiation in the 50s. I mean, come on. You have giant ants attacking a New Mexico town. What more do you want? And there shall be destruction and darkness come up from creation. And the beasts shall reign over the earth. The idea of giant irradiated ants sounds pretty ludicrous right now. Back in the 1950s, people didn't really know a lot about nuclear radiation or its effect on creatures or organic life. All they knew is that they were scared of it and for good reason, after World War II. The only thing they knew of nuclear radiation was the effects that it had on the Japanese after Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened. So who's to say an atomic cloud couldn't turn an ant into a 60-foot machine of destruction ripping through small towns? And we're starting to see a little bit of that fear come back now. And again, located in Japan, many people are afraid that because of the natural disaster there that they're nuclear power plants are going to somehow create giant fish monsters. Okay, no one's actually said they're going to create giant fish monsters. But if this were the 50s, it would totally be plausible. And that's how Godzilla was given birth. Radiation. A lot of people were afraid of radiation in the 1950s, and it's fairly obvious why. And Them is not the only movie to do it, it's just the first big bug movie. And I just happen to pick it as my example for nuclear radiation. But plenty of movies go on and talk about a similar topics such as Wes Craven's uh, The Hills Have Eyes, the original 1971, not the 2006 one. But many people were very uncertain about the effects of nuclear power or nuclear infection or radiation. No one knew what it could do, so it was very frightening at the time. And so this film was very effective for the time period. If we look at it now and think it's silly, but they honestly just did not know what could happen should something like this occur. I mean, this movie got nominated for an Oscar for Best Special Effects, and then it won a Golden Globe for Best Sound. So, as stupid as this movie seems to us, it scared the crap out of your grandparents. Survive. Here is a fear-frenzied moment of suspense as mankind totters before a thing that multiplies faster than it can be killed. Here is a desperate plunge into the black depths of the earth where human courage challenges the brute force, the slashing jaws, the poison fangs that guard the subterranean nest where the beast spawns its terrible progeny. To all units. Wall units, condition red, drain 267 is the target area. Repeat, condition red, drain 267 is the target area. Is there any type of gas we can use? No, we can't take a chance. It might poison the whole city.
The Thing from Another World, directed by Howard Hawks and Christian Nyby. The screenplay by Charles Adair, based on the short story Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr., starring Margaret Sheridan and Kenneth Toby. It tells the story of a U.S. Air Force base in Anchorage, Alaska, where a team of scientists are working to uncover an alien aircraft. Inside this aircraft is a being who has the power to take over human bodies. This ability leads to the scientists turning on one another and pointing the finger at each other in order to destroy this being from taking over the world. I believe this reflects the Red Scare in the 1950s, and ironically many Hollywood filmmakers were accused of being communist in this time. I think from another world, in my opinion, was a commentary on McCarthyism. For those that don't know, McCarthyism is the ideology created by Senator Joseph McCarthy, which was pretty much blindly accusing people of being communists without evidence. It's just this blatant witch hunt for treason that caused a lot of Hollywood filmmakers to go out of business because they were blacklisted. And I think in The Thing, when people start blindly pointing the finger at each other, that's a pretty direct hit at McCarthyism. I mean, it was the same time period, and the actions were very similar too, even in the way that the thing attacked. The creature attacked by draining blood from its victims, and that, in my opinion, just directly shows, you know, this is how people suffer from McCarthyism, you know. You weren't in prison for being a communist, but your reputation was ruined and you just financially suffocated under that pressure. While the ideology of McCarthyism had pretty much died out by the mid-50s, the idea of the Red Scare continued way on into the 80s, whenever The Thing was remade as John Carpenter's The Thing. So, do these accusations and blind witch hunts still occur to this day? Yeah, they definitely do. You have to be stupid not to think so. So, that's my argument on how think from another world reflected the Red Scare in the 1950s. So I guess it's a matter of opinion. Do you think mankind has matured enough past this, you know, blind witch hunts that I spoke of earlier? Me, personally, I think we're still afraid of the other tribe. So let's look at these McCarthy propaganda posters, and one that's not so old. What do you think? Well, I guess this is the conclusion of my video project. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And uh, if I could leave you with one thing, it's that movies in general, but more specifically horror movies, are almost always culturally relevant. They have to reflect the fears of the people that made them. Otherwise, they're not effective at all. So, be it from the 1950s, the 80s, or the current decade, horror movies have and always will reflect the fears of the society that made them. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday. This is Matt Bolton. Thanks for watching. Just show.